Wonderful. Love hearing the fellowship. I love it. I love it. I love it. Again, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Matthew chapter 12. As we look today at the point of no return, we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 50 to the very end. Um, and notice what it says there in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22. It says, Then one who was brought to him, who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, the Lord healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Father, we thank you that you came to the earth and you revealed yourself to us, Lord. Again, at this time of year, we begin to celebrate that. But Lord, we celebrate it all the time as your kids. And we thank you for what you've done. Lord, indeed, you are the son of David. Indeed, you are the Messiah. Indeed, you are the ruler of all the universe. And we can't wait until you come back to get us. But Lord, I pray as we look today at a very serious subject, that you would speak to our hearts as believers. I pray you would encourage us and give us a new sense of urgency and sharing with those around us who don't know you. And Lord, for those in here this morning who may not know you, for those who may be watching or listening or some other means they're tuning into this, Lord, I pray that if they are at that point of no return, if they're at that place of danger eternally, I pray today would be the moment that you would wake them up. And God, I know that your spirit is ready and available and desiring to do that. It is our hearts that prevents it. And I pray you would soften any heart that's hearing my voice today, and that heart would be ready to receive you, Lord, and to turn before it's too late to do so. So, Lord, bless our time together, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was a warm Saturday morning when Jim Honeycutt took Dion Woodward for a boat ride in the upper Niagara River. Now, that already sounds ominous. Honeycutt piloted his small aluminum boat through the, the deceptively calm grass island pool toward the rapids above the falls. Intent, perhaps, on giving a good view of the rapids, Honeycutt was soon past what experienced Niagara boaters call the point of no return. Honeycutt uh, sensed danger too late. He turned the boat around, but it was too late. A sheer pin failure then disabled in the motor, which left him wallowing in the swift current. In spite of Honeycutt's frantic efforts with the oars, the boat was soon overturned and in the rapids. Dion uh, quickly put her life jacket on and was dragged to safety just seconds before she went over the edge to a savage death on the rocks below. Honeycutt disappeared in 3,000 tons of water and was found days later, his body floating in the river. Again, this is a classic example of the point of no return. That is, there's a place on Niagara Falls that people like to push it. They like to get right to the edge. If they cross past that certain point, they say, unless you have a boat strong enough, and even past a certain point, apparently that's a problem, you're going over the falls. And many people, as you know, have died going beyond the point of no return. And in this story, as we see this, we see again this man believing that he could do it. He wanted to get the thrill being close to the edge. One, by God's grace, went over to the side. This Dion Woodward, she was able to be grabbed out. He again was lost because there was no way to return, and he fell to his death. That's really what today is all about. And that is the Lord is going to be dealing with the Pharisees and us about are we to the point of no return? Are we at the edge of the point of no return? And really, Niagara Falls really gives a great picture and summation of where a lot of people are in life. Again, I think about this, uh, those that kind of just kind of flounder and do nothing. They kind of put the boat in neutral and think, well, I'm going to be fine. We're going to see today, the Lord said, you know what? You can't be in neutral. You're either for me or you're against me. And if you're in neutral, you're going to be swept away into the judgment of the devil and the fallen angels, the Bible says. That's just what happens. You can't be against the Lord. Rather, if you're not for the Lord, you're going to be in a category that's against him. You cannot be neutral. The current pulls you over. Another thing about this Dion Woodward, again, there are those that wait until the last moment of life, and by God's grace, they make a decision for Jesus Christ. We hear about those stories, but statistically, they're very low, and there's very few people that ever do that at their deathbed experience. I mean, most of us don't die on a deathbed experience anyway. There's some other tragedy that happens, or we suddenly fall dead before the deathbed where the family can be around, and there's no opportunity for that kind of moment. And if we don't make a decision to be rescued before that, it's too late. And then there's those like this one gentleman. I didn't find his name, but I was kind of looking at Niagara Falls today when I was looking at this whole thing. I was looking at good examples of this and watching about all the different things that have happened. A lot of people have fallen to their death. A lot of people have done these daredevil things. There was one I saw a picture of, of a guy that got a jet ski. And I saw the picture. He rode full throttle to the edge of the Niagara Falls. And all you see, he's got a, he's got a parachute on. And the jet ski flies off Niagara Falls. They took one picture of him as he's in the air. His body's up in the air. You see the falls going over. You see his jet ski going. And the article says, and tragically, his parachute failed. 
and he fell to his death. But that is a perfect description of so many people today when they think about eternity, and it's sad. There are those that think, you know what? I'll just wait till the end. I'll put it off. At the right moment, I just believe that I'm going to be rescued. Something will happen that will pull me out of danger, and I know I'm good enough. I know I'm whatever, and I'm going to end up in heaven. And you know what? Some people do, but most people don't get pulled out. And then you see the others that say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to kind of play on the edge. I'm going to kind of be out there in the world and kind of enjoy the pleasures of the world and kind of do what I want, see the thrill of the falls, see the excitement and hear the noise and all that. And before they know it, they're swept over and it's too late. And then you've got those who say, you know what, I'm going to go full throttle toward hell and I don't care. I'm not worried about it. You've seen all those types of people. And I don't know which type of person you are if you don't know the Lord today. Those of you who know the Lord, you're neither of those three. But if you don't know the Lord today, you're going to fall in one of those categories, hoping that you either end up the right way because your boat's going to somehow get out of it, or somebody rescues you at the last moment, or you're not even going to worry about it. And probably it's not even true, and let's just go full throttle and do whatever and not even worry about it. But Jesus makes it very clear in the Scripture that everyone one day will stand before him. They will give account of their life. And if you've not made plans before you get there, it's too late. The plans have to be made now. Now again, uh, where we left off last week, if you remember the Lord was on the Sabbath, they were giving him a hard time because they made all these man-made rules about the Sabbath. And the Lord said, you're following man's laws rather than God's laws. And the Lord was rebuking them. But he ended there in, he ended there in verse 20 and 21 saying, but if, however, for those who want me, if you're a bruised reed, I'll take you. I'm not gonna throw you aside. You're beaten up, you're battered by the world. If you'll just come to me, I'll heal you and I'll make you my own. Those of you that are going out, your flame is, is, is smoldering and about to go out. He said, I'm not going to blow your fire out. I'm not going to do away with you. I'm going to bring you back to life and restore you. That is for those who want me. I'm here for you. And he would say that to you this morning. If you want the Lord and you don't know him, he's here for you. However, for those like the Pharisees, he would say, you know what? I don't want you. I want nothing to do with you. There's an ominous warning here from the Lord we're going to see today. Now, again, uh, chances are the majority of us here are not in that camp, but there may be someone here today who doesn't know the Lord, maybe someone invited you, maybe you came for whatever the reason is, and you've never really thought about your relationship to God and eternity. And God has brought you here this morning. This wasn't by chance. He brought you here this morning to say, you know what? I'm giving you a warning. You're almost to the point of no return. And if you don't turn around, it's going to be too late. And that's where we take up here in verse 22 of chapter 12. Notice then one who was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, he healed him. So the Lord heals this man who's demon-possessed. So the blind and mute man both spoke and saw, and the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Now, a couple of things I want you to note here, and that is, number one, they say, could this be the son of David? That was a, another way of saying, is this the Messiah? Could this be the Messiah? And as word begins to spread, the Pharisees are going to hear this, and they're going to get very angry because they don't want the Messiah. They want to be the Messiah. They want to rule. They want to reign. They, want, they don't want the people following God. They want the people following them. And if they're not following them, they'll lose their power. They'll lose their position. We still see people like this today. And so Jesus is a threat, and the Word of God is a threat. And oftentimes that's why that type of person attacks the Word of God and attacks Christianity so much. They're threatened by it. You see that in communism. Communism attacks the Bible, and communism attacks Christians in these countries that are in that oppression. Why? Because they realize that that's the thing that's going to defeat them. And that's the thing that will one day rule over them. So they hate it, and they fight against it. And so the Pharisees are going to hear it. We're going to see that they're going to be so hardened against the Lord, they're going to come up with any and every excuse to deny it. We'll get to that in a moment. But something else I want you to note here before we move on. Notice they brought him a demon-possessed man. And it says, Jesus cast out the demon and healed the man. It doesn't say Jesus said, oh, that's not really a demon. It doesn't say that Jesus said, oh, demons don't exist. Note this. Every time a demon-possessed person or someone the Bible says was demon-possessed is confronted by the Lord, the Lord deals with it as a real being, and the Lord casts the being out. Why is that? Because the Bible says the demons are real. They are real beings. They are the fallen angels. And the Lord casts them out when he runs into them, and they'll still do the same thing today. Now, why do I emphasize that so much? Because we live in a culture today that because of its mindset and modern mindset that doesn't really even believe in the demonic realm any, anymore, doesn't believe in demons. Jesus most certainly did. You know, it's interesting. In just a moment, we're going to see he talks about Jonah. And he speaks of Jonah as a real prophet who had a real experience where he was swallowed three days and three nights by a real giant fish. And he doesn't say that's a myth. He doesn't say that's a kid's story. He doesn't say that's something to ignore. He speaks of it as literal and is even going to use it as a sign of his death and resurrection. Now, why, again, why do I emphasize this? 
Jesus believed the word of God literally, we should do the same. And if somebody says, you mean to tell me you believe there are demons? You think that a man got swallowed by a fish for three days and came out alive? Well, Jesus did, and that's enough for me. What's amazing to me is, is people believe that mankind can create a machine that can drive around in the ocean for days and then bring people back up alive, but they don't think God can do it. Well, we're mankind. Oh, really? So you're greater than God? Listen, if mankind can do it, that's child's play for God. Child's play. And so God is more than able to, uh, again, was more than able to keep Jonah alive and to have the fish spit Jonah up back on the shore and all this. And so there's a whole story that goes with that. We won't get sidetracked in this morning. But the bottom line is recognize that Jesus deals with these spiritual things as real. And we need to recognize them as real as well. Another reason I'm emphasizing this is I believe in the darkness now that's moving into our nation. As we see our nation falling more away from God, we're going to see more demonic activity. Now, why is it we don't see a lot of demonic activity in America? Because we've had a lot of light in America. We have a lot of Bibles in America. We haven't had a lot of teaching in America. The Lord's Spirit has been moving in America. You go to other countries where that's not the case, and you see a lot of demonic activity. The only difference is the light of the Lord in the nation or out of the nation. And because we've had God's light, the enemy has had to be pushed back. But as we allow more darkness in, which we're doing very openly now in in much of our nation, you're going to see more demonic activity, and you're going to be called on as believers to deal with it. You're going to be called to pray. Don't freak out about that. These are fallen angels that have been defeated by the enemy. You walk in the authority of Jesus Christ. They can't harm you. You have the authority over them. And so these things need to be recognized. The Lord cast the demon out. They recognize the power of God's working in his life. Could this be our Messiah? And when the Pharisees heard it, verse 24, they said, well, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Oh, my goodness. Some people's heart is so hard, and they allow their heart to get so hard that the clear evidence that God is working among them, no matter how clear and evident it is, they will deny it even to the point of giving Satan credit for it. Beelzebub, as you know, was one of the chief gods of the Philistines. The Jews rightly recognized it as demonic activity. And they're saying, this is nothing more than Satan working through Jesus. This is just the enemy doing this. And this is where the danger part comes in, where people's heart becomes so hard, and they, they, they can't deny the obviousness of the power of God, so they have to come up with something to deny it in a ridiculous way. And the Lord's going to deal with it in a very logical way and completely destroy their argument, showing them their hypocrisy and showing them how ridiculous what they're saying is. Notice what he says. But Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? This is just logic. What he's saying is, look, you think Satan is going to fight against himself? These are his forces. These are his soldiers that are possessing these people. This is the work of the enemy. Why would he march in to defeat his own army? That would be foolish. Your argument has no merit to it. You're not thinking. There's no logic. It's totally led by just rebellion to God and emotion because you don't want to accept the truth of the word of God. And again, there are people like that today. It doesn't matter what miracle they see in your life. It doesn't matter what change they see in your life. They write it up to something else or they ignore it. Now, some of you have testimonies where God set you free from some you know, great vice or whatever it was. Some of it be drugs, alcohol, whatever you were trapped in. God set you free. Your family and friends saw that and they still don't acknowledge it was God today. They might say something like, well, I'm glad that worked for you. Uh, I'm glad you found the right way. I'm glad you straightened your life up. We're gonna see in a moment, the Lord says, nobody can straighten their life up. God has to do that. And we'll see that in a very graphic way, especially where the demonic realm is involved. The bottom line is God has done it and they're denying the power of God. That's just how hard a heart can become. And it's sad when you see a heart in that state because a heart in that state is a heart that is right on the precipice of the point of no return. This is the person floating in the boat or driving full steam toward the end of Niagara in a jet ski. And the Lord is saying, you know what? You better wake up or you're not gonna, you're, you're not gonna be rescued in time. Your eternity stands in, 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 in flux. And maybe some of you are here this morning. Right now, God is saying to you, listen, you have a decision to make about eternity and where you're going to spend eternity. Again, Satan's not going to cast out Satan. This is not the work of the enemy. This is the work of God. And you need to recognize that it's the work of God. Notice this in verse 28. He says, but if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, well, I'm sorry, uh, I'll skip one, 27. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? 
Therefore, they shall be your judges. Now, again, the sons of the Pharisees and the sons of the religious leaders and others, they traveled around casting out demons. They had little groups of, of these exorcists, if you will. And they had these actual ceremonies they would do in the Jewish community to cast out the demonic realm. And according to some of the ancient writings, they really believed that they were able to cast out demons. Whether or not they were, that could be a, a theological or doctrinal argument somebody else could have at a different time, but they believed that. And so what the Lord is saying is, look, you yourself believe that your own sons and those of the Jewish people are casting out demons, and you don't accuse that of being Satan. Now you're seeing me do it, and you want to accuse that of being Satan? You're a hypocrite. And the Lord's calling them out on their hypocrisy. Of course they wouldn't believe that about their own children, and they shouldn't believe it about him. They're denying what their own eyes see and what they're experiencing right in front of them. He says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Stop denying the work of God in your life. Listen, some of you have been denying the work of God. Maybe, maybe not. There's a possibility that some of you are today have been denying the work of God in your life for many years. God has been showing you. God has been doing it. Maybe God has rescued you. You should have been dead many times, and you've seen something intervene that saved it. God's trying to get your attention, but rather than saying it's God, wow, what luck I had. That was lucky. There's no luck involved at all. That was God Almighty saying, I'm going to spare you because your soul is lost, and I'm going to give you more time to make the right decision for me, so I'm intervening supernaturally, although you may not recognize it and although you may not acknowledge it because I love you that much. And again, that may be the case of some of us here this morning. If it is, you need to respond to the work of God. He says, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can a man enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? You know, it's very logical. You can't go break in and steal somebody's things unless you first bind them, right? You could find some when they're not home, maybe break in. That's not the example he uses here. They say, no, I'm going into the enemy's camp. I walked right in the midst of the enemy. I took away his power. I took away his authority and I released this person and I healed this person and you're not acknowledging it. You're not seeing the hand of God at work. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't some, I didn't pull myself up by the bootstrap, bootstrap, so to speak. God did this. And so uh, confronting them straightforward and showing them their error, he's going to get firmer with them as this goes on, we'll see. And notice he says this, this is where he draws the line in the sand and it, it gets more intense from here. He says, he who is not with me is against me. Note that. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Again, this goes back to the person who puts it in neutral at Niagara Falls. Well, I'm not against God. I'm not opposing God. I'm, I'm not really for Satan. I'm just not really for God. Well, you're going to go over the falls. It's just a matter of time. Because there's going to come that day that it's going to be too late. and There'll be no turning back. You have to make a decision. And again, if this morning God is prompting your heart and you've been saying, well, I'll just kind of wait and see what I think. I'll wait and see whether this is real. Uh, this whole rapture thing, if a bunch of people disappear, then I'll get serious about God. Listen, if you cross that point of no return, there's no more decisions that can be made. You have to recognize when we stand before God, that's it. Whatever decision we made before that, that's what's going to be for the rest of eternity. And this is why the Lord is speaking so firmly on this subject. And this is why I'm relaying it so seriously. And this is why the Lord is going to get, get even more uh, uh, serious on the subject right here. Look what he says in verse 31. Speaking of these same Pharisees. He says, therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks the word against the son of man, it will be forgiven. He says, hey, if you say something against me, that'll be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Wow, that's serious. He's not saying you name call against the Holy Spirit or you name call against, that's not what this means. What he's saying is, if you insult, blaspheme, blaspheme means to insult. He's saying if you insult the work of the Holy Spirit long enough or in certain ways, you lose your opportunity for salvation. Now let me give you some rest first. Some of you, it's nice to, if you don't know the Lord, I'm, I hope you're a little bit uncomfortable, but the fact that you're here, I don't think you've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So I say uh, at this point, you still have a chance. So what do I mean by that? Listen, the Bible says no one is drawn to God unless the Holy Spirit draws him. The Bible's clear on that. God draws us to himself, and then we have a decision. Are we going to choose Christ or reject Christ? But the bottom line is nobody even has that choice unless the Holy Spirit draws them in, which means if you're here this morning, someone drew you here, and it wasn't you. 
By nature, man does not seek after God. It has to be an intervention of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit drew you this morning to Calvary Chapel. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to God. And if you have any desire whatsoever for the things of God or to go to heaven, you've not committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because if you've insulted the Spirit and His work has completely stopped working in your life, you would have zero desire for the things of God. You wouldn't care if you're going to heaven or not. You wouldn't even believe in hell. Say, That's a bunch of nonsense. Religious mumbo jumbo. I don't care about it at all because there's no working of God whatsoever in your life. So the good news is, if you're drawn here today and you're in this place, chances are you've not committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because God is still working in your life. The bad news is, if you don't know the Lord, there could come a point you reach the point of no return. And we really see two definitions of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is one definition? Well, the Lord gives one right here. He says this, if you attribute the power of God to Satan, he said, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's, a, that's a thing you cannot do, number one. So that definitely comes into play of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He makes that clear right here. But I think the larger picture of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit has to do with the Holy Spirit's job and the Holy Spirit's calling, if you want to say it that way, in the life of the unbeliever. What do I mean by that? Jesus said again in, in, in John chapter 16 and other places in scripture, it says that the Holy Spirit's job is to draw us to Jesus. And as he's drawing us, he's wooing us in saying, you really need to give your life to the Lord. What that pastor is saying is true. You need to repent of your sins. You need to give your life. There's going to be a judgment one day and you're going to stand before God. I want you to be forgiven before that judgment so you can enter into the kingdom of God. You need to come to Christ. You need to give your life to the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit. That's not your own thoughts. It may be friends that are led by the Spirit speaking in your life, but that's the Holy Spirit. If you continue to resist that and resist that, no, 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 there's going to come a point where you're too far and too close to Niagara, and there's nothing left but to tumble overboard. Pharaoh experienced this. The Bible says that Moses going to Pharaoh multiple times, and it says Pharaoh hardened his heart, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh, there's like seven or eight times it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then this verse, it says out of the blue and shockingly, and just kind of catches, really catches my attention. It says, and then God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And when you look up what that word means, it means this literally. God agreed with Pharaoh's decision. That is, okay, Pharaoh, you hate me that much. You want to rebel against me that much. You want to reject me that much. If that's really what you want for your whole life, if you continue to reject after all the miracles that I've shown you with all the plagues that happened in Egypt, all the signs, all the wonders, all the ways I've revealed myself, if that's really what you want, I'll solidify it. I will agree with your decision and now it's solidified. You can't be saved. That's a scary place to be. And the scarier thing is it happened to Pharaoh before he died physically. And the Lord is going to say here, these Pharisees, it's happening to them right now, some of them, and they have quite a while to live, which means you can cross the point of no return before you even die. You know, we often say, well, you've got a chance till you die. Everybody's got a chance till their last breath. In general, I believe that. I do believe that for most people, they have that opportunity because most people don't harden their heart that much. They just don't make a decision. But for those who harden their heart enough, the Bible says there is a point where even while you're still alive, you're a dead man walking. And now there's no more hope of salvation. Now you see why the Lord is dealing with this so seriously. He's saying, you need to take this serious. You need to look at this from a serious perspective. We're talking about eternity here. We're not talking about something temporary. This is forever. And that's why right after this, the Lord gets really, really blunt and straightforward and gives an extremely harsh rebuke. Notice this, look at verse 33. He says, either make the tree good or make its fruit good. Um, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. In other words, make up your mind for the tree is known by its fruit. You can tell by looking at my life, Jesus was saying, by the fruit coming off of my life, that I'm of God. I'm opening the eyes of the blind, the deaf, dead are rising from the dead. I'm healing leprosy and unhealable disease. I'm doing miracles in front of you. What kind of tree do you think you're looking at? My tree is good. Your tree is bad. You need to recognize the difference and you need to make a decision. Stop making excuses and make a decision. It's been said that people that are good at making excuses are seldom good at anything else. And the bottom line is, he says here, you need to make a decision for God. And notice this firm rebuke, he says, out of the blue now, brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, this brood of vipers, it literally means children of snakes. A brood is the offspring of snakes. He said, you're children of Satan. Your father's the enemy. And you need to recognize that. You think, well, that's just kind of a harsh approach. Is that really the best approach to take? It is when someone is to the point of no return. 
If your child is getting closer to the road and you keep warning, warning them, don't play in the road, don't play in the road, stay closer, to the, don't play in the road. And every time you look, they're getting closer to the road. Finally, you look up and your kids are in the road and there's some car screaming down the street. What are you gonna do? You're gonna run out there and grab your kid very aggressively, maybe even violently, not to be mean, but out of, out of fear and out of the urgency of the situation and yank them to the side and look them in the eyes and say, what are you doing? You're about to die. Listen to your father. That's what this rebuke is. I believe this is Jesus' last ditch for those who haven't already crossed over the point of no return, those listening to the Pharisees, those gathered around these religious leaders, and he's saying, this is it. No more games, no more religion, no more church, no, no more, I'm glad that worked for you. This is forever, and you better decide right now because you're about to cross over a line you can never go back from. And guys, there may be some here again this morning or even watching this or listening to this that's saying, God is saying to you right now, you're involved with the enemy. You're involved with the brood of vipers. You need to repent. You need to turn before it's too late because there is a point of return. And if you go so far, then the decision won't be made. Again, I encourage you, if God is speaking to your heart this morning and you know you, know you don't know the Lord, this is a serious thing. I, I don't believe we're by chance in this portion of scripture. I didn't get up this week and say, well, let's find something that we can go and just kind of condemn everybody with and talk about hell or something, right? And I'm not condemning anyone. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious and I don't mean to be uh, with a serious subject. But this is where we happen to be as we're going through the book of Matthew. And this is where you happen to be as we got here today. And this is where those watching online happen to be today. And this is where those listening by radio happen to be today, right now. Which means God planned this. And God is saying, some of you are at a point of no return. You have a decision to make. Now's your moment. And I, and I see God's love here. You, know, you look at this and go, how could this be love, brood of vipers? No, I see God's love here because God loves them enough to yank them out of the road and say, you know what, you need to do something right now or you're gonna die forever. I love you. Stop being foolish and make a decision for Christ. And notice here he says, um, again, this is a very interesting description. He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That is, you're revealing who you are, who you belong to, and where you come from by what you're saying, because the heart reveals where you are. And again, this is, a, again, just a truth in principle that you can use throughout life. They were revealing that they were involved with Satan because they were saying that even the work of God was being done by Satan. They were denying the work of Jesus. But also here he says, you know what? When you listen to someone, you know what's in their heart. You can tell what's in their heart. And so it's interesting by the words people say, look, if you want to know what's in someone's heart, let them speak for a while. You know, tell me about yourself. Tell me about your life. You'll hear what's in their heart. And oftentimes that's a good way to know how to pray for them and how to minister to them and how to direct them. The Lord is giving us a key here into looking into the heart of man. And their heart was being revealed quite graphically. He says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But I say to you, and this is scary. Again, there's so many things in here that get your attention. But I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. Whoa. The Bible says on judgment day, the books will be opened with an S. Everything we've ever done has been written down. Everything we've ever said has been written down. I don't know about you guys. I don't want every idle word to be exposed. I don't want to give account for every idle word. The Lord says that if you're not right with him, every idle word you ever spoke, you'll be held accountable to on the day of judgment. Here's the good news. If you know Jesus Christ, your slate has been wiped clean. That's the good news. You will not give account for idle words because all your idle words have been washed under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the cross. And to that I say, hallelujah. There's things I don't want you guys to know I said or that I did. And I bet there's things you don't want me to know, you know, not the pastor. You know, yeah, well, I've got my own stuff, you know, not the congregation, right? Thank you, Jesus. But if you don't know the Lord, it's all there. Look, there's stuff that, that, that I've forgotten about from my childhood that I did wrong. There's stuff I said that I forgot about from childhood. That I, there's stuff I said last week I can't remember at this point, but the bottom line is <laughs> we're all going to be held accountable for that. And God's going to bring it off and put it right in front of us. And here's, here's the thing that's so, again, so serious about this and daunting to me. If you can stand before the Lord at that moment and say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize this was all true and I just didn't really want to do it and I, I thought it was just kind of this religious stuff and, and, and I know I said this all, I, I, please forgive me now. How wonderful that would be. The problem is the Bible says that once you, once you die and leave this body and stand before the Lord, there is nothing else. You, there's no more plea you have to make. You can't make a plea for forgiveness. You can't ask God to have mercy. It's too late. There's nothing at that point 
but certain judgment, the Bible says. And that's why the plea is so urgent now. Make the decision now before it's too late. Because once you're there, it's done. For by your words, you'll be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered and said, Teach us, we, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. you think they would say, oh my goodness, I need to repent. I need to be forgiven. Instead, what did they say? Show us a sign. Prove that you're who you say you are is the idea behind this. They didn't care about the Lord. They're saying, prove that you're who you are. Well, like, what kind of sign would you like to see? Like what you've been watching for the last couple of years? The dead being raised? Uh, the blind seeing? Uh, the deaf hearing? Uh, the lepers being healed? Is that the kind of sign you want to see? It just shows you're fake. You're not going to believe no matter what I show you. I've shown you every sign I could possibly show you. You're just wanting to see something so you can try to uh, have some kind of way to deny me. You're making up excuses. And by the way, as believers, we're not supposed to be, you know, following signs anyway, are we? Signs are supposed to be following us. That is, as we preach the gospel, as we pray for people, people are healed, things are happening. That's the true mark of a believer walking in the spirit of God. But they say, we want to see a sign. Notice he hits it hard. He answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Wow. Sign seekers, he says, that's evil. You need to believe God. You need to be out just serving God. Let the signs follow you. Why adulterous? Because oftentimes it comes with false worship. You're looking for something to, you know, to some kind of false worship besides what God has given. It's spiritual adultery. He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, this is a pretty major sign, by the way. Remember the sign of the prophet Jonah. As we said, he was swallowed three days, three nights in the belly of a, of a great fish, probably a whale. We're going to argue over semantics. But then he gets spit up again three days later and goes in. And remember, he preaches in Nineveh. And, and, and by the way, there's this great revival in Nineveh, this Gentile city, which would really been an insult to the Jews. Uh, you know, we talked before about what uh, Jonah would have gone through, the, what he would have looked like. They say the stomach juices in a whale will just dissolve the, the, the outer skin away and the color of the skin. It's after him being there three days, he would have been probably completely bleached white. His hair would have been bleached white. Those that have studied the juices in, in the belly of a whale, they say it probably would have eaten off a little bit of his lips and ears by then. Because the way that a whale does it, a whale swallows you whole. Those that, that do it that way, the larger whales, they can take in large you know, animals or whatever. They'll swallow, they'll go to the depths of the ocean, swallow giant squids sometimes. They say they've opened up whales before and found 30, 40, 50 squids in their stomach still alive. Why? Because they swallow them a whole and they swim around in there for a few days until they die. That gives you a whole different picture of what Jonah went into, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, I mean, think about it. All this happening is like, okay, I repent, I repent, I repent. I'm gonna give you three days to think about it. Oh, you know, wow, what's that? What's that? What's that? You know, and the heat and the slime. Oh my goodness. You talk about wanting to go and preach the gospel. He, that was an attitude adjustment in a big way. And now notice what he says about it. He goes, that's the sign you're going to have. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'm going to descend. I'm going to lead captivity captive. That's a whole nother teaching. But I'm going to be just like Jonah, and I'm going to resurrect and rise three days later. Um, and, and that's going to be the sign you're going to get. And notice what he says. Here you are, the Jews. You're supposed to be the promised ones, the ones that you know, are, are, are just a shoe in with God. You believe you are anyway. But the Gentiles, the men of Nineveh, will rise up in, con in judgment with this generation and condemn it. You're going to be judged by the Ninevites. They hated the Ninevites. Gentiles and evil and all their pagan gods. Those guys in that generation, because they repented and believed in Jonah, they're going to judge you. This would have just been making them angrier. He says, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, like you're not repenting. But they did. It says, indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Well, I'm greater than Jonah the prophet. Of course he is. He's God in human form, the Messiah. He goes, he goes on, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it as well. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon all the way from Ethiopia and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. Remember the queen of Sheba comes up and she comes and, 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 and visits Solomon. She wants to hear of his wisdom and the Bible tells us here that she ended up giving her life to the God of Israel. So she was saved. He said, she's gonna be there judging you guys as well. well so you think you're the authorities? You think you're gonna judge everyone else? No, you're the ones gonna be judged because you didn't repent and you need to repent. And now he describes what they are like and what their generation is like in a lot of this demonic activity that we just saw at the, uh, back in verse 22 and 23. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest and finds none. 
And then he says, I'll return to the house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So also shall it be with this wicked generation. Now, again, he's saying, you're like a generation where I'm casting out demons. I'm showing you my power. I'm shining my light and removing the darkness. And you're, you're rejecting it, which means when I'm gone, there's gonna, it's going to get worse. There's going to be more demons move in. Notice we get some actual sideline in, uh, you know, information about demons. Notice he says in 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. They don't like to be unembodied. The demonic realm, the fallen angels, they want to be embodied. That is, they, whoever they can possess, they will. Now, again, you have to be an open vessel for possession. A Christian can't be possessed. The scripture is clear on that. But for the unbeliever, even they have to be an open door, dabbling in things they shouldn't be dabbling in. But once that happens, it opens a door to the demonic realm. That's what they're looking for. I think about the Gadarenes. Remember, they cast all the demons out of the two men in, in Gadara, and they, they went into the pigs. Can we at least go into the pigs, right? I mean, we'd rather be deviled ham than just kind of be out here doing nothing, right? And so the bottom line is, what happens? Remember the pigs run down the water, they all drown, and then they're done? They, they had a very short-lived embodiment, but that's how much they don't want to be unembodied. And says, so not only did, but notice this, this is key too, because some of you in here today might be saying, well, I'm not really ready to give my life to the Lord, but I'm straightening my own life up. I went through rehab. Uh, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not doing drugs. I'm going to live right up. I've swept and put my house in order. Listen to what he says about that mindset. He said, when those demons come back and find the house swept and put in order, but it's empty, they'll bring in seven worse with them than were there than before. You see, here's the thing. Once you turn away from what is wicked, if you don't fill it with Jesus Christ, you're in big trouble. Only Jesus can fill the house and stop it from being taken over again if the demonic realm has begun that influence in that life. And again, a warning. Uh, you know, I would even say, especially if we do see demonic activity in America more, if we do pray for people for a release from the demonic activity, we need to be leading them to the Lord immediately. Saying, you need to have somebody fill that home because you're not gonna be able to do this on, you can't be good enough. The enemy is gonna come in and take over no matter how good you try to be. You need Jesus Christ. And so he says, the last state will be worse than the first. That's what this wicked generation is like. Now his family hears about this. He's claiming to be greater than Jonah. He's claiming to be greater than Solomon. He's, he's acting like the Messiah. They're saying he's the son of David. And we're gonna see probably not Mary because Mary knew she had the vision. She knew that, but she was traveling with her family. His brothers, the other gospels tell us, were jealous of the Lord. They didn't like him at this time. But we see they got saved later on, but his own brothers were against him. And so notice what it says here. Mark tells us they, said they thought he was out of his mind. And look what it says. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and his brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. They'd come to rescue him. They were doing an intervention. He's nuts. You know, he's involved in some cult. He's doing whatever. We've got to go rescue him. Of course, Mary would have known the, the truth, as we said. And, but they wouldn't have listened to Mary. They were jealous of him. They were angry at him as brothers. We see that again in the Gospels. And now this, could be, this should be a comfort to you because if you have a family that's rejected you because you love the Lord and they think you're crazy, you're in good company. They rejected Jesus, and they thought he was crazy. But I love what Jesus says. He says, then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers, they're standing outside seeking to speak with you. Oh, I'd love to see this. But Jesus answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and my brothers? And he wasn't attacking his mother and his brothers. He just said, there's nothing special about my mom. There's nothing special about my brothers. They're earthly family, but there's nothing special about them. I'll tell you who's special. Look at this. And he stretched out his hand. Picture it in your mind. He stretched out his hand toward his disciples. That is everybody gathered before him in that room. And he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Isn't that great? It doesn't matter what your earthly family is. It doesn't matter what your earthly family thinks about you. What matters is your spiritual family. Have you been born again? Have you believed in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross? Have you come to him before the point of no return? If you have, you're a part of his family. And, he, and listen, he's not ashamed to call you his family. Isn't that great? You know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, there's probably people in the world that would be ashamed to call me a family member. You look at some of these people and the way they are, whatever. I'm thankful the Lord's not ashamed to call me his son. He's not ashamed to call me his brother. He's not ashamed to call me part of his family. He's not ashamed to call anybody in this room a part of his family. He's not ashamed of you as long as you're not ashamed of him. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll deny you before the Father and the holy angels in heaven. 
He said, but if, you're, if, if you speak of me and you're not ashamed of me, he said, I'll pronounce you in front of the Father and all the holy angels in heaven, and you'll be a part of my family forever. And guys, here's the question as we finish today. Which family are you a part of? Are you simply a part of an earthly family? And maybe they're really a nice family, but that earthly family is not going to get you into the kingdom of God. You need to be a part of the heavenly family. And the only way you can be a part of the heavenly family is to be born again, and that is to confess your sins to God. Confess, ask him to forgive you. Believe he died for you on the cross, and the Bible says you're born again, and you'll have your new family and your place in heaven forever. So some of us, I believe, need to settle that question this morning. What family am I a part of? Am I a brood of vipers? Is my family, am I running with the snakes, right? Or am I, am I part of God's family? Which family am I in? Listen, some of, you, some of you may even be at the point of no return. I'm not saying you crossed that point yet, but there does a point come where it's too late. I'm not trying to use scare tactics. I don't, I don't think that, let's look. The Bible does say save some with fear, but I think that really a true heart conversion is knowing that God loves you and knowing that he died for you. And if you'll simply come to him, he'll receive you into the kingdom. But there are times where God uses fear and it might be that God has put fear in some of your hearts this morning saying, wait a minute, I don't have this whole thing sealed down and I'm not even quite sure I kind of like what the pastor's saying right now. I don't know that I want to do that. That just shows your heart's already getting hard. You're already getting, you're already floating in Niagara. The falls are not far away. Here's my plea to you. Before you cross that point of no return, Start your engine and go the other direction by receiving Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for those of us who know you in here this morning. And we know, God, that you have covered our sins. We're forgiven. We have our new family and our place in heaven forever. But, God, there's no doubt some watching or listening or will hear this, whatever the case might be. And, Lord, they're not a part of your kingdom. As a matter of fact, their heart is already getting hard. As a matter of fact, they've heard this kind of today. But even at that, right now, they're resisting. They're not quite to the point of no return, but the engines have stalled, and the boat is floating the wrong direction. Lord, I pray for anyone right now that's hearing this message that's in that place, that you would now jolt them, that you would now throw them a life raft and say, you better grab on to Jesus right now, and I'm going to pull you to shore because you're about at the point of no return. And once you get there, I can no longer help you. There's nothing left but judgment. I want you before that day arrives. So there'll be nothing left but feasting and rejoicing in the kingdom of God. And if that's you this morning, I make an appeal to you. Respond. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't insult him. Don't insult him by rejecting him. Respond and receive him. Just tell the Lord, I confess to you I'm a sinner. Lord, I I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I believe that you died for me on that cross. And Lord, I give my life to you. Receive me into the kingdom. Father, I thank you for those that are praying that prayer right now. We give you praise and honor and glory for that. And ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to see.